Now, John, in his gospel, states his purpose up front. Well, it's towards the end. Let me take you to John 20 and verses 30 to 31. John says this, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. I've just thought one day perhaps we'll get to know what those stories are. Yeah, that'll be something, won't it? These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That was John's heart in writing the gospel. He wanted both Jews and Gentiles, because his gospel actually connects with both sets, to come to faith in Jesus, to believe that Jesus was who he said he was. And so John, right at the start of the gospel, um, sets out his stall. He tells us who this Jesus is that he wanted his writers to believe in, that he wants you and me today to believe in, to put our trust in, to put our faith in. For John, this was an eternal issue of life and death. Because failure to believe in Jesus would result in condemnation and death, whereas true faith in Jesus would lead to eternal life. And perhaps one of the most famous verses in, in all of the Gospels comes to mind, John 3, 16, but also 17 and 18. God loved the world, and for John he's thinking, that means Jews and Gentiles. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only son. Now, John is making it absolutely clear, isn't he? For who Jesus was, who Jesus is, mattered then. And it matters now. In his introduction, he says this, so that we have a clear idea of the Jesus he's going to introduce us to. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of all humankind. The word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Nobody could accuse John of a hidden agenda, could they? He is stating it up front and clear. This is the Jesus I want you to believe in so that you may have life, capital L, eternal life, life in all its fullness. The Word was God. The Word became flesh, and that Word was Jesus, born in Bethlehem, resident of Nazareth, his home village. And then throughout the Gospel, John starts to stack up the evidence of what Jesus did, what he said, so that at the end of his Gospel, he says, now I've written this so that you may believe. <laughs> John's gospel is a gospel that highlights in many ways the godness of Jesus, that he was God in the flesh. But interestingly, John's gospel is also the gospel that uh, tells us that Jesus was also fully human. For instance, John chapter 4, the story of Jesus and the woman of Samaria at the well. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, and then John puts this little phrase in that this speaks humanity. Tired as he was from the journey. You know what it's like when you go, oh, we sit there. If you're tired from a journey. He sat down at the well. Jesus looked weary. And it was noon. It was hot. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, oh, will you give me a drink? <laughs> He was thirsty. So John, in presenting to us Jesus, tells us his humanity was real. And then towards the end of the gospel, we find on the words of Pontius Pilate, the great statement in 
chapter 19 and verse 5. Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, look, here is the man. Which on Pilate's lips might have just meant, here he is. But when John records something like that, there are more than one meaning to be got. Yes, here is the man, Christ Jesus, who is also the word of God. This man, this Jesus, is the great I am. Now, David last week touched uh, on this, but allow me to, to build on that. We're in the middle of looking, as you know, at the seven great I am sayings that uh, John has recorded in this gospel. Seven is an important number for John. It's the perfect number. He records seven signs or miracles. He includes seven I am sayings, and seven keeps cropping up in different ways through the gospel and also then into the book of Revelation. But that's another story. But as well as those seven I am sayings, there are, dotted through John's gospel, other statements of I am that it's easy to lose in English translation. So I, I just like to bring them to your attention because this is all part of John's building up the picture of the majesty and the glory of who this Jesus is that he is inviting us to believing that we might have life. David last week referred back to Exodus chapter 3 and Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. Moses, of course, is told to take off his shoes because he is moving onto holy ground, moving into the very presence of God. And then there's this conversation uh, with Moses. And Moses asks, well, when they ask me, who are you, this God who is sending me, tell them that I am sends you. Exodus 3, 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now bear with me a moment. Most Jews, at the time of Jesus, would have either read, if they could read and write, would either have read or heard the Old Testament being read, not in Hebrew, but in Greek. By the time of Jesus, and it's quite likely that Jesus could speak Greek, by the way, by the time of Jesus, the Roman Empire had a common language, and it wasn't Latin. <laughs> because the empire previous to the Roman Empire was the Greek Empire of Alexander the Great. And so although the Romans defeated the Greeks militarily, Latin never conquered the Greek language and Greek remained the international language of the Roman Empire, which is why the New Testament is written in Greek. So people all over the empire could read it and understand it. And many Jews throughout the empire had long since lost the ability to read and understand Hebrew. So in the second and third centuries BC, the Old Testament was translated into Greek. And that's often the Greek translation of the Old Testament that the New Testament quotes, and not the Hebrew. You still with me? Yes? Yes, yeah, some of you are. Great. So it's interesting to look at how that statement in Exodus, I am, is translated into Greek. And you've already got there ahead of me. It's translated ego I me, which is the Greek of the I am of Jesus is saying. So immediately Jesus says, I am like that. People would have known instantly. Well, the, the God of Moses is the great I am, isn't it? Isaiah chapter 43 and, and verses 10 and 13 declares this. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that what I am. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. Yes, and from ancient days I am. And in the Greek translation of those verses in Isaiah, it's ego I me. So now we can look at these other, what I've called, 
supplementary sayings where Jesus says, Ego I me, I am. John 8 and verse 24. That is why I said that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, and in most English translations, that's not put in capitals, it's unless you believe that I am he. But then you miss the fact that it's saying, Ego I me. You believe that I am, you will die in your sins. You see, for John, this is important. You've got to know who Jesus is. You've got to believe in him. Otherwise, you will die in your sins. And you do not want to die in your sins, do you? Believe in this Jesus, who is the great I am. John 8, verse 28. Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man on the cross, then you will understand that I am. I do nothing on my own, but say only what the Father has taught me. And it was by being lifted up on the cross that our sins could be forgiven and forgotten. And we want our sins forgiven and forgotten, don't we? Well, says John, believe in this Jesus. And John 8, 58, Jesus answered those who, with whom he was disputing, the Pharisees and the religious teachers. I tell you the truth, be healed before Abraham was even born. What? Ego I me. I am. Now Jesus could have said, and it would have been quite a claim if he said this, before Abraham was, I was. <laughs> but he doesn't say that. He says, I am. He claims to be the great God who was in the beginning with God. Not just pre-existing Abraham as some creature, but as the great I am. John 13 and verse 9, I tell you this beforehand, so that when it happens, you will believe what? That I am. And so they did. They believed that Jesus was the I am, and the early Christians then proceeded to turn the ancient Roman world upside down. And because they did, we're here today. But there's one more that I want to show you. But first of all, take you back again to Isaiah and verse 44 and verse 6. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, Yahweh Almighty, and Yahweh is the name of the I am God. I am the first and the last, and apart from me there is no God. Put that together with Revelation 1 and verses 16 to 17. In his right hand he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. This is John's vision of the exalted Christ. His face was like the sun, shining in all its brilliance, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. What an experience that must have been. Then he placed his right hand on me, and John heard words he had heard his Lord say many times before, don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. Wouldn't you have done exactly what John did in those circumstances? Imagine it. You have seen with your own eyes the stunning, magnificent, brilliant glory of the ascended, enthroned Christ. Your breath would have been snatched from your body. Who among us would not have followed John prostrate before the glory of the great I am, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is John's Jesus. The great I am who offers us the bread of life, who offers us light 
for our darkness, the gateway to immortality, the good shepherd who dies for his sheep, who is the way and the truth and the resurrection and the life, the true vine in whom there is life. You see, John isn't holding anything back. He's given it us. Whoosh! This is Jesus, the Word made flesh, the great I am. And that's the Jesus I am trying to preach to you this morning. And I think as once with Moses, are we not on holy ground? Should we not, only metaphorically, take off our shoes and bow in worship? But there's one more in John's gospel. I take you to John 18, verses 5 and 6. Jesus and his disciples are in the garden of Gethsemane. And the soldiers come for him. Who are you looking for? Jesus asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. What does Jesus say? Ego I me. That's all he said. In English translation, we say, well, I'm the one. No, he just says, I am. John notes that Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. But as Jesus said, I am. They all drew back and fell to the ground. Whew. Who are you looking for? Well, a man. You, Jesus of Nazareth. I am. And it's as if a, a wave of glory shot out with those words from Jesus and knocked them back to the ground. As they, in ways that we can't perhaps imagine or understand, felt the glory of this man, whom they'd come to arrest, <laughs> whom they would have had no chance of arresting unless he let it happen. Because he was the great I am, and they felt it. What do you feel at the moment? I can't make you feel what they felt. I've said, Lord, if the congregation this morning are going to feel anything, it is only by your spirit. I can't do it. Over to you. If you are feeling something now, then it is the presence of Christ by his spirit, revealing himself to you in new and renewing, fresh and refreshing ways. So what is your reaction to this Jesus of John's gospel. John has given us the template, if you like, of what our reaction should be. You know the story. Thomas wasn't with the disciples. Oh, unless I see the nail print in his hand, I will not believe. A week later, Jesus turns up. And it's one of those fly on the moment occasions. I would love to have been there to see the look on Thomas's face when he saw the Lord. <laughs> and Jesus just approaches him. Here we are, Thomas. Put your finger there. Well, Thomas doesn't, does he? My Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And of course, if you believe, put your faith in Jesus, what do you get? Life, the blessing of eternal life. And so I'm going to end with the scripture with which I began. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. 
but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. Like we could also include in that the great I am. And that by, lead, by believing, you may have life in his name. Spend a few moments in quietness. Bring to God the worship of your own heart. Do what you say with all the sincerity you can muster what Thomas said before this news. My Lord. And my God. You know those words of Jesus. It is I, do not be afraid. May we feel now the touch of your hand upon us as John did on the Isle of Man. As that hand upon us gives us strength and courage, determination, dedication, follow our Lord. To be his true disciple. Lord Jesus, Messiah, I am. Gift us afresh with your spirit, we pray. Open our eyes. We want to see you. We want to see Jesus. Hear our prayer. Amen.